Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is the third event in our Cells Winter Speaker Series, Technoscience Beyond the Nation State. I'm Matthew Sample, Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation here at Leibniz University, Hanover. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn at the Faculty of Humanities, will be moderator for our Q&A later. So um, I mentioned that because if you'd like to ask a question to the speaker, please send it to Anna using the chat function, and she'll call on you or synthesize your question with several others if, if they overlap. We also have captioning from Norma at GRT Captioning. Um, if you'd like to use that, you can either use the Zoom button, uh, the little CC button, or you can click on the link in the chat, which I will send now. So just a few words as usual about the theme of the series, why we're, why we're hosting it. Science, uh, knowledge, and technology, both in history and still today, are deeply entangled with nationalist projects. This means they aid in consolidation of power, they provide means for acts of violence. Our hope over the course of the series is that we can tackle both of the meanings implied in the title, beyond, beyond the nation state. So this means not only that we'll critique particular combinations of technoscience and nationalism, but we also want to try to advance new ways to act and live together across borders in, in, in international solidarity. So today, we're really fortunate to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Farfan Santos. He's the author of two books, the first one, Black Bodies, Black Rights, The Politics of Quilombolismo in Contemporary Brazil, and, and then uh, the subject of our discussion today, Undocumented Motherhood, Conversations on Love, Trauma, and Border Crossing. Both are published by University of Texas Press. Elizabeth has a PhD and MA in Medical Anthropology from UC uh, Berkeley and a BA in Cultural Anthropology from Trinity University. Her research and writing focus on the health impact of political exclusion, and racial inequality. And recently, she's joined the faculty in the Department of Health Systems and Population Health at University of Houston. There, she teaches courses on medical anthropology, health equity, and cultural humility. So thank you so much, Dr. Farfan Santos. So I'm going to unpin myself and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be joining you all the way from Texas uh, and just being able to speak to folks um, across this border. Uh, and like you said, I'm really trying to think of ways that we can make changes and collaborate beyond all of the borders. Um, so it is wonderful to be out there with your communities um, and hopefully you know, we will be able to connect with each other in person someday. Um, I am really excited to talk about this work. Uh, so uh, my book, Undocumented Motherhood, which has just recently come out, I wanted to start off uh, by talking a little bit about, and actually I'm going to share my screen before I forget, um, which I just practiced. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to start off uh, first by just kind of giving a little bit of background on how this uh, book came about and the larger project behind this book. Um, uh, as you said, you know, my work uh, at the moment is focusing on um, health access for uh, marginalized communities, particularly undocumented Mexican communities uh, in the United States and specifically in Texas. Uh, I started this work probably around 2014 formally, but have really been thinking about access to health and really been interested in how the public health system works in the United States for a long time, uh, primarily because I grew up in the public health system and my family benefited from the public health system. Uh, and so it's something that, you know, I've always heard my mom, my mother be very grateful about uh, uh, us being able to, to have access to quality health care, um, despite the fact that we were uninsured and, you know, um, not a wealthy family. So um, it's always been something that's very been very near and dear to my heart. But in 2014, particularly in the United States, this was the time that there was conversation for the first time in most of our lifetimes, certainly my lifetime, anybody on this call's lifetime, uh, that we had talked about healthcare reform in the United States ever. Um, it was really historically not even something that could ever even be brought up 
Um, and so it was revolutionary that at the time we had a president that was not only talking about healthcare reform, but uh, really strongly using a discourse of social justice and access for all. There was a lot, I mean, the camp, his campaigning, President Obama's campaigning was around justice and around hope. So there was a lot of hope around thinking about the possibility of people really having uh, humane, affordable uh, access to healthcare. Um, at the same time that all of this was happening, there was a really stark and in my eyes, uh, surprising and aggressive exclusion of a very large group of people, billions of people in fact, which was the undocumented immigrant population. Uh, at the time I was really you know, interested in understanding how that exclusion at, you know, during a time when there were so many people kind of paying attention to what was going to happen with healthcare policy and potentially getting excited about having healthcare, having access to healthcare for the first times in their lives. Uh, I was really interested in understanding how that exclusion was potentially affecting undocumented communities, how people were receiving that messaging uh, from the media. I knew from my research that undocumented immigrants had been um, excluded from public health resources, had been excluded for generations. Uh, folks have no access to any federally funded programs and a lot of state level programs really depend on the state in Texas because we have a, such an authoritarian and conservative government in Texas and have had it for over 27 years. Undocumented immigrants have never had access to any resources um, unless it comes down to the community level. They knew this was true. At the same time, um, their exclusion was so, in, was so intentional and so visible that I wanted to know what was happening. Um, at the time, also, there was a lot of confusion within the public sphere around what it meant to have insurance. A lot of people had never had, over half the population had never had insurance. People didn't know what it meant to have a co-payment or a premium, what any of the language meant. There was a lot of confusion that largely public health workers, um, particularly community health workers and people in community health clinics were kind of left to scramble and kind of answer lots of questions and you know really try to deal with all of the confusion particularly for the immigrant community, there was a lot of confusion around who exactly was included and who exactly was not included. And it was really scary for people because at the time there was a penalty for not have, there was a penalty attached to not having health insurance. And so you could be charged on your income taxes. Um, a lot of undocumented immigrants have what are called TIN numbers, or identification numbers that they use specifically for paying federal taxes. So this is something that you know, we say over and over again, undocumented immigrants pay taxes in all sorts of ways. Um, and then specifically, you have folks that are filing their federal income taxes with these numbers. And because of that, we're really um, unsure about their, uh, whether or not they were included. And so there was a lot of confusion in that sense. And I was finding that when I was working at the time, I was working in community health centers. That's where I was meeting folks. That's where I was interviewing folks. And that's what I was finding, um, largely what I was seeing. Um, so I went in with the idea of talking to folks about marginalization, alienation, exclusion. Uh, and that's not exactly the conversation that people wanted to have. <laughs> so when I got into the clinics, um, you know, I was noticing largely clinics were full of women, mothers, and their children, which in hindsight isn't surprising uh, across racial and ethnic groups. The people that uh, tend to care for a family's health tend to be women. Uh, and so it, it wasn't surprising that clinics were full of women and their children. When I started to talk to these women, what they primarily wanted to talk about was their children's access. Um, these were women who had copious and detailed notes of taking their children to the doctor, what needed to be done, you know, was it because they needed a um, physical for school or because they had a chronic condition that they were, you know, very aware of what they needed to do to take them to the doctor. They knew why they were there, they knew what needed to be done. And, you know, this is what they were interested in talking about, their concerns for their children's care, their, con their concerns for how their children were being treated in the clinic. Um, and those were the stories that I was, you know, kind of immediately flooded with. It was really interesting to me to, um, to then kind of revert the project to focus on these narratives because one of the things that I had noticed in my work um, was that largely when you're looking at immigrant uh, research on immigration, particularly 
uh, research that has to do with uh, um, immigrant health access, um, you tend to have research that doesn't pay a lot of attention to the intersectionalities of people's identities. Um, and so a lot of, you know, immigration research has tended to focus on, or folks have tended to interview young men, generally between the ages of 18 to 25, let's say, because these were the dominant migrants that we've had kind of historically, right, dominant migrants that were coming as laborers, generally when you're talking about the US-Mexico border relations. Um, and so this is the group of people that were being interviewed for the most part for immigrant research. Um, so then the research kind of writes about this group of people, but doesn't really specify that these are the, this is the demographic that they're looking at, right? Well, when you're thinking about a 20 year old young man and a mother of any age, you know, you have, those are very different people, right? <laughs> and they're gonna have very different experiences, particularly when it comes to healthcare, health access and the family. So it was really important for me to highlight that because what I was seeing, particularly in uh, looking at public health research, was that a lot of the research was talking about immigrant communities and Latinx communities um, in a language that was not only um, pathologizing, I saw as pathologizing, but recreated this idea of kind of a bad patient, right? These are people that, you know, are responsible for their illness, for their chronic illness, particularly diabetes, um, you know, which is what gets highlighted about our community. These are people that are not going to the doctor, you know, for, for various reasons. So there's that kind of bad patient narrative. But what I was seeing in interviewing mothers was the complete opposite, right? I was seeing an overly responsible patient and person who was not only very much aware of what their family needed, but was putting themselves at risk, really, um, to engage with the public health system. So when we think about what is required of us when we engage with, uh, with the medical system, at least in the United States, um, it, it, it requires a lot of visibility, right? Um, a lot of vulnerability about intimate aspects of our lives, not just about our own health, but our family's health, our family makeup, you know, what our family is doing on a daily basis, our address, our, you know, our age, our birthday, all of this kind of documentation that is, you know, that women are uh, putting out there, um, you know, despite being undocumented, right? So they're not in the shadows when it comes to how they're engaging with the public health system. They're very much visible and highly documented, actually, um, which is incredibly courageous. And they're doing this because they know that it's important and necessary for their children's health, but also for the other aspects of their children's lives that require this kind of um, engagement like their education system, right? So the education system in the United States, in Texas, you know, you have to have these physicals, you have to be vaccinated, these kinds of things that they, paperwork that they have to produce for their children. And they're, they're doing these things. So immediately the project then became about the work that women are doing um, as kind of health navigators for their families, but also the ways in which they end up being these pillars of uh, resilience and kind of future building for their families. When you're talking about undocumented immigrants, you're talking about people who are not supposed to exist, right? It's kind of this paradox, right? Legally, they're not supposed to be here, but, you know, it, it, physically they are here, right? And, um, there's no intention, not only is there no intention for their future, but their future is constantly uh, um, threatened and erased. And so you have women that are imagining futures out of nothing, out of thin air for their families, right? And they're doing this particularly in terms of the, the body, right? When we think about a healthy life as part of a future, um, we can also kind of look and think about how people are denied particularly in the United States, we're so, you know, where um, healthcare is not a human right, um, but rather is dependent on your income, all of these other things, political status in this case, um, you know, you're talking about the denial of a healthy future for certain groups of people, right? And then women who are claiming a healthy future for their families and doing what they need to do. So that's the background. And I've published some papers on this um, and those papers specifically speak to public health workers and speak to the public health system and really trying to change and, and rethink and be more mindful about how we conceptualize and engage with undocumented communities um, and not kind of recreating these narratives of this kind of pathological bad patient, you know, uh, discourse.
Um, so within this work, um, and as I'm interviewing women in clinics, I meet Claudia, who is the subject of this book, um, the, main, the main person in this book. And Claudia is different because she is dynamic. I mean, they're all dynamic, but she really wants to share more of her life. Um, and so I'm able to engage with her and all of these other levels of her experience from her migration to kind of her hopes and dreams for the future. Um, and so I, I, you know, we start meeting outside of the clinic and we start meeting in her home and we find out in that time period that actually our children go to the same school. And so we have even less degrees of separation and more things in common, which, you know, really kind of adds to our, our, our relationship and a lot of our conversations and our interviews, which are really conversations, I see them more as conversations, um, you know, become, you know, moments where we're also kind of talking about what we need to do for the kids' school, and do they need to dress up as something, and do they need, how do they have homework, and, you know, I help, I'm sometimes helping her, you know, translate things, although she doesn't really need it, <laughs> she's got a hang of it, a handle of it, um, and then the book kind of, you know, comes to focus on, on that relationship, um, Throughout the book, um, you know, what I what I really want to do with this text, as opposed to what I do with the other works, which are much more academic and specifically geared towards that medical audience. You know, with this book, I'm really trying to look at the whole person as Claudia as a whole person and the undocumented immigrant as a um, historically and politically dehumanized subject and really try to you know, revert that discourse and rehumanize, I guess, if you will, um, that subject. Um, and so the objective of the book then becomes about uh, uh, creating an emotive uh, um, narrative for the reader. Um, you know, I'm really interested in people feeling something, right? Um, engaging at the level of empathy and compassion and human connection more than just, you know, the politics or the mind, although that's also in the book. Um, and I, and, you know, this, it's, it's kind of a, um, a broad objective in the beginning, but as I am talking to Claudia and as I am um, then transcribing the interviews and figuring out how to book, put the book together, I'm doing this myself, right? I'm, listening to her story and I'm thinking about my own uh, family's migration, my mother's experience immediately. I mean, it, it happens almost automatically. And I don't know that I expected it to happen. I don't think I expected it to happen. When I started interviewing Claudia, I wanted to be really, um, uh, I wanted to engage her in my kind of thinking process of how the book might potentially come about. Uh, and so I did tell her that, you know, the book was going to be a little bit more creative, that there was going to be, you know, information that was going to be changed, not just for her safety, but also potentially to incorporate the stories of other women. At the time, I was thinking about incorporating other some of these other women's narratives that I was interviewing. Um, I wanted her to know that, you know, it, was, it wasn't going to be a word for word reproduction of, you know, her, her, um, her interviews. And that was important because, you know, as an anthropologist, you know, there's at least my, for myself, you know, I have a really strong sense of responsibility for what I do with anybody's story or any kind of vulnerability that somebody shares with me. When I was writing my first book, Black Bodies, Black Rights, um, in Brazil, you know, that was about a fight for land rights that was happening in that moment. And, you know, people were under attack. Uh, people were defending their rights, their, the rights to their, you know, their physical homes. And the kind of the condition for inviting me into their communities was that I would document kind of almost word for word what was happening and that that was going to be something that was going to help them, you know, kind of claim their, their truth and their authenticity um, and speak to these debates about their authenticity. So the book had to look a certain way, right? Um, even though it, it, I, it was still from my perspective, but it had a, a different purpose. Um, and so I wanted to be very clear and upfront with her that this book, what this book was going to look like and make sure that that was, that was okay with her. So we had that conversation in the beginning. Um, and then, you know, then it, it so it, it, then it became about um, more so the connection that I was seeing with the women and the mothers in my life. 
And that was the aspect that I ended up interweaving in with Claudia's story um, so that she would she wasn't kind of surprised when she saw some of these differences in the book. And ultimately, there is a lot of kind of word for word from her interview anyway. Um, but then, um, you know, the weaving in, I think, is a way to model these kinds of connections that I'm hoping that the reader will also eventually have or be able to do as they're reading the book, right? connect back to their to their maternal narratives, to their mothers, to their migrant stories. Um, in the United States, uh, Latinos have uh, primarily, you know, our families are made up of mixed status families. So it's very common, um, actually, a very common experience for us to have people of all statuses in our family. And even though our experiences are different, my experience is not the same as Claudia's, my mother's experience is not the same as Claudia's. And I'm, I make that very clear in the text, um, the border and the, the impact of the U.S.-Mexico border demographically and um, politically, you know, historically has such a huge impact on our families, not just in terms of our, how our families are made up, but in terms of the intergenerational, um, you know, traumas and forms, you know, things that we have to heal within each other, ways of knowing each other and relating each other. You know, all of that is also impacted by the border in addition to just being, you know, family stuff that, you know, we have like any other family has, right? Family dynamics. Um, and so that, you know, the, the, the interweaving of stories that the reader will find as they're reading the book um, is also a way for me to kind of model the kind of connection that I'm hoping that they will also make, be making in the book. Um, you know, I think one of the, you know, the most important uh, messages that hopefully will come out of the book is, you know, how much we have in common with each other, particularly at a time in the United States when there is so much division and the discourse of division and violence against marginalized communities is so intense. Um, I want, you know, us to remember that we are not actually fighting each other. Right? We have a lot in common, our differences are incredibly important. Um, and But we, we, we can't even understand our differences and have empathy and compassion for our differences if we don't first also aren't able to also connect um, with some of the things that connect us as, as human beings. And these are some universal um, experiences, things such as hope and um, you know, the expectations and the, the, um, the desires that we have, the concerns that we have for our children for the youth and for our futures, these are things that you know, kind of we share across racial and ethnic groups. So uh, I'm gonna stop there and I've already talked a lot. I'm just gonna read a little bit and then um, talk a little bit more about a different kind of different aspect of the book. So this is um, from a chapter called What Sickness? And let me see if I have it. Well, I don't think. See if I have it on here. No, I don't have it on here. That's okay. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and when I was interviewing uh, Claudia and, and other mothers, I was really interested in not just, I mean, I, 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 I wanted to listen. I, I listened carefully to their stories about their children and their, their children and their children's care, but I also wanted to know about their own health. Um, and what was happening with them because I knew that their access was even, you know, they had even less access than their children in some, in, in many cases. Um, when I was talking to Claudia, it took time for me to be able to develop the rapport with her, for her to, I had to listen to her uh, talk, talk about Nati, her daughter and her, and her daughter's needs. Uh, her daughter is deaf and, you know, she's trying to get her access to hearing, uh, to cochlear implants. And this is kind of the, the story that you know, gets narrated throughout the book. Um, so it took time for me to get to Claudia's own illness narrative and what was going on with her. And when I finally get to talk to her about it, you know, I find out that she's been struggling with fibromyalgia, um, pretty much started when after she migrated. And um, then she had a bout of cervical cancer. Where she had to have part of her cervix removed. And she talks about these things in a very nonchalant kind of way like yeah this you know this, this is what I'm dealing with but what can I do you know it's just I don't, I don't have the money to go to the doctor I don't have anyone to help me people depend on me so I just have to say to myself what's sickness and keep moving and so that becomes then the, the title of the chapter uh, so I'm going to pick up from there and, and read a little bit now <laughs> 
Claudia couldn't really say how long she'd experienced the symptoms of fibromyalgia, but she was sure it started after she migrated to the United States. I thought about her revelation of feeling overwhelmed and hopeless as Nati's mother and sole caregiver. Seemingly disparate parts of her story were beginning to connect. The physical body of trauma was forming like a puzzle, coming into view with each intangible piece. For years, Claudia had been suffering from the symptoms of fibromyalgia, feeling chronic and invasive pain all over her body, while also fighting with doctors to obtain care for her daughter, worrying about how she would pay for everything and being tortured by migraines, nausea, and dizziness. But despite everything, she was also learning how to mother a strong and independent daughter with a hearing disability and learning how to adapt to and align with all of the demands of a North American life, including learning English and American Sign Language, teaching her daughter about both of those as well as Spanish, dealing with teachers and physicians who questioned her motherhood because of the language she spoke or didn't speak, while also being undocumented and feeling burdened by the numerous barriers and threats she faced just driving her children to the doctor. To say that she was dealing with a lot is an understatement. It's more than most of us could handle. Fibromyalgia was Claudia's body screaming for help, begging her to stop and heal, begging someone to help her stop and heal. Fibromyalgia literally knocked Claudia off her feet and made it impossible for her to do anything, even walk. It made her, for the first time, demand that her husband help her. Illness is the body communicating to us and everyone around us that something is wrong and we need to listen. Sometimes the body whispers, but other times it shouts. Because everything else is noisy and demanding, the body must be louder, especially for women. It makes sense to me, given all the demands and pressures on women and mothers, that women are more likely to get an illness characterized by chronic, generalized pain all over the body. It makes sense, given how uncompromising the demands on women are, that women would be more likely to get an illness that makes their bodies cry in pain and shut down in protest. I wonder how many undocumented immigrant women might be suffering from undiagnosed fibromyalgia how many might suffer from depression and anxiety caused by fibromyalgia. Bi biomedicine doesn't know the exact cause of the disease. There isn't just one cause located in the material body. It can, can't be dissected out of a person and biopsied. It doesn't fit under a microscope or in a test tube. We may never know how many undocumented Latinas suffer from fibromyalgia or other stress-induced illnesses from the strain and complexity of an undocumented life compounded by gender demands, chronic pain, and the stigma of an invisible illness screaming but unheard. My whole body hurts, todo, Claudia went on, but I don't think the doctor's helping. Sometimes I don't think they believe me or they think it's just in my head. He just has, he hasn't told me to stop eating anything or giving me any other solutions. He just tells me to exercise a lot. So I go and exercise every day, but I have to wear knee braces because my knees hurt so much. I mostly go to Zumba, but here in the house, when I'm home with my girls, I do some things too. My husband bought me some cositas so that, so that I could also do some exercises here in the house whenever I could. Se siente feo, sabes? The pain is the worst. The pain in my hips and in my knees, that's what I feel the most often. The pain in those parts of my body, sometimes in all over, I can't even say where, in my shoulders, here and there, in the fingers of my hand, here, all over, it just feels awful. It's awful because you're just standing, you know, just standing there and boom, all of a sudden, your foot gives out and it hurts you, it hurts you, or you want to walk. There are times that I kneel and I don't get up anymore because I can't and I'm not good at kneeling because then I have to crawl over to something I can grab onto in order to bring myself back up because my knees and hips hurt so much. Entonces se siente feo estar así. The medicines the doctor gives me are for the pains. I take them every day. I went back to the, all of this is for life now, por vida. Two weeks ago, I went back to the doctor, right? Because the pills weren't working anymore. So he had to prescribe me a much, much stronger medication. I have to take them, but I don't like to take them because they are so strong that they are hitting me hard. And I know that I will get used to them. And then one day they'll stop working and then there won't be any other pills that will help because that was the limit, none. So I really didn't want a stronger dose, but they had to increase it because I felt I felt the same. Pain, dizziness, y para allá y para acá, y me lo tuvieron que subir. I have no choice but to take them. As I was listening to Claudia, I was thinking about how hard she was trying to feel better, 
There wasn't any room in her day for chronic pain. She had too much to do. I felt a pull in my gut, imagining Claudia crawling around the room alone in pain, trying to pull herself up. Her concern that the doctors didn't believe her pain, that they might think it's all in her head, wasn't at all far-fetched. There's a long history of women's pain being dismissed or ignored by doctors and of doctors rejecting women's complaints of physical pain and attributing their symptoms to psychosis or hysteria. Instead, gender bias in medicine, like racial bias, doesn't look like a doctor calling a woman hysterical and sending her home. It can look like a woman pleading that she's in unbearable physical pain, that her knees ache and that and the doctor telling her to go exercise more. There are other factors that would also render Claudia's pain invisible to U.S. doctors. Her comment that the doctor just insists that she needed to exercise more kept replaying in my mind. I couldn't shake the connections. In my research, I had found more than a few instances of doctors pushing uninsured Latina patients to, quote, be more responsible for their own health, feeding them a particularly paternalistic formula of do better individualism and acute personal responsibility that had become common in healthcare but that always seemed to be especially cocked, loaded, and ready to shoot at the working poor and uninsured patients of color. Besides the multiple biases in her medical encounters, Claudia was also experiencing the stigma of having a chronic illness that wasn't physically evident, of feeling pain that altered her state of being and limited her functioning, that nobody could see or understand. Se siente feo, Claudia said over and over, lacking the words to describe the depth of her suffering. I also lack the words and society lacks the words and sympathy for these kinds of experiences. People like Claudia might get an initial recognition of their suffering, but after a while, with no proof of disability, the sympathy withers away in the face of the demands of the day, the demands of normalcy. The children have to be cared for, the food has to be made, and the house has to be cleaned, and Claudia has to do it, period. Es por vida, Claudia lamented. She would have to struggle with the debilitating symptoms of fibromyalgia every day for the rest of her life, performing normalcy to get through the day, and all she had were painkillers and Zumba. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm, I'm listening to Claudia talk about uh, the chronic pain that she's struggling with, and then later she tells me that she's, you know, that she had this uh, uh the scare of cervical cancer, you know, that has left her with recurring fibroids. And that's another kind of pain that she's also daily pain, chronic pain that she's experiencing. You know, I'm thinking about all of the different layers of um, her experience that have potentially contributed to what she's feeling. And I'm making these connections. This, this is kind of the, the medical anthropologist, you know, where I'm connecting all of the environmental, the political factors, all of the stressors and that have created trauma, you know, that have kind of um, seeped trauma into her body. Um, with fibromyalgia, you know, there's no known, um, uh, biomedicine doesn't really know what causes it. Um, you know, we know that it's primarily women that experience fibromyalgia and that it's generally tends to be, you know, some kind of traumatic physical or psychological event, right? And so I'm, you know, replaying all of the different traumatic physical and psychological events that Claudia has experienced, particularly just in her migration um, and all of the things that she that she saw, all the situations that she was put into, you kind of you read that first chapter of the book and I'm making these connections for her, which she hasn't necessarily made herself. Um, and part of it is, is she hasn't really had time to stop and think about it, you know, because she's been so busy advocating for her daughter. Uh, and you know her her care because healthcare in the United States is so uh, bureaucratically charged and so physically and emotionally exhausting. Anybody in this country, whether you have insurance or not, can tell you how exhausting it is. You know, interacting with the healthcare system in this country, it is not easy. It takes time and resources. Um, and so then add to that, you know, being a historically marginalized subject, not having health insurance, and then having that added political layer of alienation of being undocumented. And so there are all of these different layers that, you know, women will, will cross through all of those barriers for their children. When it comes to themselves, it's, it's not the same, right? They, they're just, there isn't, there isn't the time, they're more likely to just put it off and kind of suffer on their own. So that is a really important part of why women are not always taking themselves to the doctor until they have no choice that Claudia, they've collapsed 
Um, and at the same time, there's also a really, um, you know, uh, powerful script of Mexican femininity and kind of cultural understanding that as Mexican women, we grow up with, which is, you know, the sense of strength and resilience that we have to have for our families. You know, women um, within our community, at least, you know, when, when I was growing up, I grew up with, um, I was raised by seven, nine women. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very strong female matriarchal household. And, you know, I, you know, grew up learning that, you know, you, you do what you got to do and you, you roll with the punches. You know, everyone in my family was working and enduring a lot, particularly as an immigrant family. Um, and you don't, you know, um, you don't complain about little things, right? Which includes pain <laughs> sometimes. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up with my grandmother saying things like, you know, we don't drown in a glass of water, right? So it, it's small. If you're still, if you can still stand, you're, you, you keep going. Um, and so it made me think about my own mother um, and the way that Mexican women really hide uh, the pain and illness that can that can almost kill them you know that almost kills them um you know, my mother had a hysterectomy there are other women in my family that had hysterectomies um you know i talk about my mother's experience with uh, very serious anemia, anemia and um hemorrhaging um and a moment when you know she she really put her life in danger because she just didn't take herself to the doctor and it wasn't easy for her to access um, and i'm making these connections not just in terms of the you know physical environmental political experiences that women are carrying that women carry in our societies as really being ascribed being the uh, ascribed caregivers for um, not just children but for societies in general you know with very little value and respect for women's lives um that being a part of it, but also some of the narratives, the cultural narratives that are attached to that, that we internalize as, you know, things that we have, to, you know, that we have to do, that we have to sacrifice our lives for the community. You know, is it wonderful that communities are surviving because, you know, and, and that we have futures for our communities because of the work that women are doing? Yes, it's amazing. It's that's, you know, why so many of our communities, despite all these attacks, are surviving. At the same time, you know, these are hu women are human beings, right? And and we're not objects, right? So we become these pillars of society and that's heavy and that's inhumane. Um, and there's no support for women in this country, right? For our health. There's even very little knowledge about our health, right? Discussion about our health. And so I'm also kind of, you know, speaking to those narratives and trying to highlight the ways in which, you know, um, those are parts of our identities as mothers, as women, you know, we care about our communities, we care about our children, and also how, you know, neoliberal capitalist nations take advantage of that care work, um, you know, and take advantage of women's work um, and, and, you know, cause these kinds of, that creates these kinds of pathologies in our bodies, right? And then when we need help, then we just get kind of silenced and it, that, that pain gets um, rendered invisible. Um, and so there, there are those connections as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to share um, before opening it up to questions is um, some of the images that are shown throughout the book. Um, and so the cover image is um, one of my drawings and a watercolor painting. And then there are several of these images throughout the book. Um, these are called uh, blind contour drawings. Um, which, you know, in the art world, you know, these are kind of blind contour drawings are intensive studies, uh, sketches that are studies of a, of a particular subject that, pe that we do generally to really get a good, you know, uh, handle on a subject that we're, that we're trying to, to paint or to produce. Um, I love blind contour because it's a different kind of interaction with the subject. And so when you're doing a blind contour drawing, you're looking at a subject and you're drawing the subject uh, in a single line drawing without ever looking down at the paper and without ever lifting your pencil or your pen from the paper. Um, and you're just kind of intensely looking at that subject. And it's such an interesting experience because when you're looking at the subject that intently and you're, you're done with the drawing, you really think this is going to look exactly like the person because you're so focused on every detail. And then you look down and it's a complete abstraction. So 
um, you know, and you know, you get a little bit better as you go, hopefully. Uh, but you know, it really speaks to another kind of message in the book, which is really about this the relationship between me as the author, the writer, um, the witness uh, to Claudia's story, and her as the storyteller, the speaker, and the subject. Um, it is uh, the blind contour is a uh, is a is a visual representation of perspective for me. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you do a blind contour drawing, and in the last chapter, I have several of these, which is, I have a lot of different images of Claudia, where I'm just kind of practicing drawing her. Um, and everyone, even though I'm doing it in the same sitting, some of these I've done, in, I did in the same sitting, they're completely different, right? And so, you know, it really speaks to perspective in the sense that, you know, not only am I receiving Claudia's story through my lenses, my multiple lived experiences, um, which I'm very, you know, uh, um, uh, clear about throughout the book, but also that pers my, even my perspective is constantly changing and dependent upon all of the situatedness of my life in the moment, right? Everything that I'm experiencing and feeling in any given moment. So if I were to sit down and write the book again right now, it would be a different book because I'm a different person. Claudia is a different person. Um, so just as I am constantly changing, we are all constantly changing. So too is Claudia constantly changing. She's not the same person that she was today, you know, that she was when I interviewed her. Um, and that's really important when you're talking about um, marginalized communities within research. A lot of times, specific, uh, specifically in the social sciences, they will get, you know, kind of um, t uh, t uh, written in a way that makes it seem like this is the, you know, I am the authority. This is who they are, period. You know, and, you know, that's not true. That's not true at all. <laughs> you know, what we see as researchers is a very small portion of people's lives. Um, and we try to make sense of that very small portion of people's lives. And then people continue to change. Right. And I am no more authority on Claudia's life or on undocumented lives than, than any anyone else's. Right. I mean, I can barely explain my own life sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, we are, you know, not you know, we can't have these authority, you know, these, you know, we can't create these authoritative narratives. And for an anthropologist, it's really important to emphasize that and to always, you know, kind of be deconstructing that idea of anthropology as this kind of authority on culture or on any community's experience. Um, part of rehumanizing a population of, you know, removing that pathologizing discourse is, you know, is really reinserting all of the different right to humanity, which is fundamentally our, our right to constantly change and to be multi-dimensional and multi-layered and contradictory and all of these different things that, that we are as human beings, right? Um, and so the the uh, blind contour is just kind of another visual representation of something that, you know, I, I also try to kind of uh, in, insert in the book and in, in the writing, really always kind of coming back to, you know, my own perspective and how my perspective is impacting this. Um, and, you know, I, the, the narratives, the stories in the book, um, whether it's my mother's story, my grandmother's story or Claudia's story, you know, I talk about them as being woven into each other um, because I really, as opposed to separated, uh, right, into different sections. So a lot of times, you know, anthropologists will write about their own lives within books, but they kind of separate it out in the, you know, in an afterword or in a preface, and it's very much divided. So part of weaving the stories together for me is, again, also modeling that interconnectedness of human life, right? That we are interconnected and influencing each other as we're talking with each other and as we're witnessing and being witness, bearing witness to each other's lives. So thank you so much again for inviting me and having me. I'm looking forward to hearing some questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth.